Hello and welcome. If you could predict the future, could you do something about it? Does the knowledge really help you prepare for what's coming? Information overload, throwaway society, power shifts, digital revolution, the knowledge age. It's been 40 years since Alvin Toffler popularized these terms in his portrait of things to come in the groundbreaking book Future Shock. Toffler saw Future Shock as a disorientated state where people are overwhelmed by too much change in too short a period of time. But he said that instead of resisting it, society should be prepared for it, coining the famous expression, change is the only constant. Well, 40 years on, the whirlwind of modern technology continues to change our lives in ways we could never have imagined. So today we ask, how will our future be shaped by modern developments and can we ever really be ready for it? Remember, you can call in with your questions and comments and we also welcome your emails and text messages onto the show. Well, joining me in the studio is Deborah Westphal, who heads the Future Sa uh, States Forum, founded by the Tofflers to consult organizations on how to get the best out of fast-moving global society. Following in the Toffler footsteps, she recently predicted 40 key trends that she thinks will shape our world in the next 40 years. And in London, we have Henry Mason, head of research and analysis for trendwatching.com, which has just published its crucial consumer trends for 2011. I welcome you both to the show. Thank you. Deborah, if I could start with you, actually. Hi, uh, hi, hi Henry. Uh, get to you in just a second now. Deborah, first, to what degree um, are the next 40 years likely to bring as much change as the previous 40? Well, we think that it's going to be bring even more change. Um, we're just uh, we're in this accelerated change, um, not just technology, but society and organizations, and we think it's going to bring even even more rapid change. So, what is the benefit of knowing what's coming up? How does it really affect the way we can prepare for it? Well, if you do, I mean, you can adapt, right? You can adapt. You can get out ahead of it. You can understand it. It gives you hope. Um, it gives you hope for the future. And uh, so we, we see that it's, it's very important to, to try to understand what's driving that change and, and use that to, to adapt your organizations. We're going to bring in uh, Henry Mason here and ask, Henry, you, you, f you follow trends. Um, to, to what degree do you, well, what trends do you find to be the most significant? What do you think really are the, the greatest indicators of what change is likely over the next uh, few decades? We l when we're looking at trends, we like to look at uh, which trends are actually happening now. Uh, because one of the biggest one of the biggest developments that we think is happening in the world at the moment is that actually it's becoming a single global marketplace. And actually, if you're aware of what's going on, whether it be in the US, whether it be in Asia, whether it be in South America, that actually enables you to put yourself in a position to take advantage of these changes. Well, how accurate can you be in, in following those trends? And, and, and to what degree uh, do trends follow the patterns that you, you sort of predict? Well, I think especially now with you know with the internet and online you, you, you can just watch what's going on uh, you know to take for example a, um, a trend that's been big over the last 12 months and we expect to continue it is you know, these, these daily deal sites uh, and we've got Groupon in the US um, but then the, you know they're also popping up in China with Turbab in in the Middle East with with go Nabid is another example of this and really you know there are entrepreneurs out there who are who are looking at what's happening and really shaping the trend in their own market. Well, Alvin Toffler's book, uh, Future Shock, uh, was the inspiration for a documentary with Orson Welles. And here's how he captured the, the mood of, of that idea. We live in an age of anxiety, a time of stress. And with all our sophistication, we are, in fact, the victims of our own technological strength. We are the victims of shock future shock. Now, Deborah, that, those were prophetic words from Orson Welles there back in the 70s, well before the internet overtook our lives, as did Facebook, Twitter, personal devices, mobile phones, and so on. And I wonder to what degree you think the legacy of the so-called information overload has had an impact on us? Well, I think that's uh, one of the, the greatest things that Alvin and Heidi gave us was this understanding that change is going to happen, and not just in technology, but in society, and in our politics, and our uh, uh, economics, and and, uh, and I think that um, they did leave that legacy to help people, people adapt. Um, humans are uh, slow, slow to, uh, to make these changes, and, and we find ourselves in that, uh, that situation right now. But, but uh, you know, if you step back, we're, we're making change every day. Well, let me get an email to you, Deborah, that came in from uh, a viewer by the name of Sidra Jaffa, who wrote into our Facebook page, saying, technological revolution has blurred our understanding. More gadgets, less patience. Now, is it true that we're getting less patient as we, we want instant gratification with these devices? 
Well, the information overload, and it's uh, in, in trying to figure out what's useful information and what's not useful information. And I think that's the uh, one of the uh, the implications of, of what we've got, we, what we have here. And people will adapt to that. They will we will learn to to take what they need and, and throw away the rest. Um, we see that this uh, there'd be a lot of cyber dust. We talk about cyber dust in our 40 on 40. A lot of information we're collecting, and, and um, a lot of it's irrelevant uh, for what you need to to, to do. Well, let me get Henry in uh, here with an email as well to you, if I may, Henry. It's coming from uh, from our Facebook page too, from Zainal Abedin Mohammed Jayas, who wrote in saying, "The technological uh, revolution has certainly reshaped our cultural landscape, but factual information is much harder to acquire." Now, I wonder what, to what degree that's true. That there's so much out there, but people really don't know how to get the right stuff. You know, that the education hasn't ca of, of how to use that uh, technology of information hasn't really caught up uh, with with the way we're using it. Well, I think there's really two, you know, there's two sides here. Yes, there's, there's more and more information out there and, and, and people are struggling to find out, you know, wh which information is trustworthy. But then the flip side of this, and I think this is something that Deborah talks about as well, is that whether it's corporations or, or organizations, you know, they have a harder and harder job protecting information, especially untrue information. Uh, so, so while there is information overload, there's also uh, what we like to call transparency triumph. Okay. Let me let me get to, let me follow up on that. One more uh, email on this uh, issue of technology, and I'll Deborah, I'll put this to you. It says, even with the technology we have today, people either refuse to look at all sides of the pyramids. Uh, technology only makes things clearer if you put it to good use; otherwise, it's useless. I would agree with that, uh, and I think we would agree with that. The uh, the idea of what is truth is um, is something that we're we're, str we're struggling with. You you just can't take one side of the story. You have to really search out many, many different options to, to get your information and, and, uh, and, and use that. Henry, I wonder, do you see us becoming more and more uh, dependent on technology to the point where the, the personal touch, the, the human factor gets lost? So do I think the human factor is Yeah, I, I wonder, with the dependence that we have on technology and the way we are interacting now, certainly through the internet, for example, it, it, to what degree is that, that whittling away the human factor? Well, I, I don't think really that you know technology will ever replace you know people's desire to connect with other people. Uh, I, I'm really you know witness one of one of the great successes of the last you know decade or, or not even full decade is, is Facebook. And, and yes, while it's a technological solution, what they really provide is, is the ability to connect with the people that matter to you and the causes that matter to you. And uh, you know so so really technolo technology is interesting when it's an enabler. Well, that's what I'm wondering, though. That, I mean, if you look at Facebook, for example, it's very much done, you know, across computers, the, the sort of personal touch of, of being face-to-face, -face, you know, pardon the pun, but being face-to-face -face in, in person, has, it seems to have disappeared. I, certainly, you know, there are aspects of, of interaction which are moving online, but um, I, I think the desire and, and really the, the motivation to meet up with people and, and connect is still definitely there and indeed you know there are many examples you know from um, anti FARC rallies in Colombia uh, to, to other marches all around the world where, where people are actually using Facebook to to get out there and to meet up with people whether it be political mm -hmm. activism or just a personal interest. Okay. Well Deborah you know it's interesting the Tofflers are very good at coining phrases uh, such as prosuming a combination of producing and consuming and obsolege uh, obsolete knowledge which I, th I think you know it's where we fill our heads with ideas with, with knowledge that we perhaps don't really use that much and I think cyber dust is a form of obsolege is that right? Cyber dust is the, the collection of a lot of information that uh, isn't being used. Isn't being used. It may be useful information. It may be uh, information that uh, could be used to, to cure cancer, uh, but we just don't see it. Where there's just so much of it that it just becomes dust. Um, oh, so the idea that that useful information is being masked by the quantity is that the idea, or is it yes. having information that's not of not any use to us? Yeah, obsolete is, is the the, right. the useful or the no, information that's in, yeah. not in, of any use anymore. And, and cyber dust is just there's just so much information out there that uh, um, it just it's just being collected and not used. 
uh, Henry, for, can I touch on an idea of, of consumption and how that's changing around the world? And, and one of the things is, of course, we're seeing a growth in the developing world, the, the growth of China, Brazil, India, these countries uh, at a rapid pace. The middle class is growing. And I wonder to what degree um, you see those middle classes developing in a different way from the middle classes that have been established in the West, in, in America and in Europe, for example. Well, I, I think obviously, you know, every culture will have uh, really their own their own features and, and their own unique approach. But you know, this is, this is one of the megatrends that we see happening right now is this emergence of this global consumer class. And you know, consumerism to us is really about having options, about having choice. Uh, you know, but that's really the reason why people are moving to cities. You know, all over the world, they're, they're moving to cities so that they can. A, earn more money, but B, have more choice. And uh, really, you know, they, consumers will always express their, their choices in the ways that are important to them. But what we are seeing is that there are actually more similarities than differences amongst consumers all over the world, whether this be the search for social status or identity and community. You know, there are some universal, fundamental human motivators which, which appeal to everyone. Right. Well, let's get a call room. We've got Iad from Germany on the line. Iad, what would you like to add to the conversation? Yes, hello. Good Hi. evening. Good evening. Uh, I have actually a question more than a contribution. The sensitivity of uh, this projection, which kind of uh, sensitivity there are, and the idea behind this can get in the opposite way. For example, we think that it can, the, the cinema can be 3D and stuff like that. What, what will happen if we go in the opposite side and we say what is the sensitivity behind all these uh, technology and uh, the modeling, for example, you said uh, that you are uh, kind of modeling the, the future. And what is the sensitivity behind the, uh, uh, these predictions, I would say? Uh, Yad, can you clarify what you mean by sensitivity specifically? Yes, uh, sensitivity, uh, for example, we think that, um, yeah, in the 10 or 20 years uh, future time, um, it can be, for example, um, like the iPhone can be uh, uh, developed or uh, just only we think that it will be developed. Uh, okay, so so the, to, I guess to some degree it comes down to Deborah. To what degree um, are our expectations met? Um, how how likely is it that the things that we imagine will come will actually materialize? I, I was giving an example of 3D TV. It would have, only a few years ago, no one would have conceived the idea of having 3D TV right. in their home. Uh, some of the predictions or some of the the desires will uh, will will take place. Uh, a lot of them won't. I mean. We still don't have flying cars, and right. we all wa watch Jetsons, right? Are our expectations built up, though? I mean, to the point where cinematic uh, excellence has allowed us to imagine these things being real. You know, even way back to Star Wars, we were seeing these float hovering devices and so on. Have our expectations uh, been raised to the level where we're, we've, we want those things now? Um, I, don't, I don't think it's been raised unreasonably. They're, they're dreams, right? They're dreams for people to, uh, to pursue. And um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that that's, that's an issue. Well, let's get Barry on the line from Norway. Barry, what would you like to ask? Hello, Mr. Khan. Hi. Well, it's a pleasure. First of all, I'm so glad you know, to have you for at long last after I've been your big fan for many <laughs> Thank years. Thank you. That's kind. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, I'm from Gambia, and mm. I live in Norway. Okay. Um, uh, concerning about technology, yes, um, I've got two um, sides here. Technology has did a lot you know, in this world. It has helped us a lot. But if you think of in Africa today, um, uh, what technology is doing also after helping us in terms of um, uh, internet and telephone telephones, but it's also damaging certain parts in Africa. Um, you will, you'll see today many people are going in for mobiles, mobile phones, mm. and while they are not capable of having even a mobile because they, they don't have economically, they don't have the power of economy of getting themselves a mobile. And believe me, sometimes they will even use their fish money given to them by their men for them to cook food and they will just take this fish money and go right. and buy
cards, you know, <laughs> so that they could you keep on calling friends and people or whatever, you know. And also internet, in terms of internet, many children today are going in, in, into, uh, more into internet and doing so many dangerous things in terms of, in terms of pornography. And, right. and these are people who have been brought up in better, better ways. But because of technology, because of internet, because of telephones, so it's damaging certain many, many parts. Um, um, okay. Yeah. Barry, so, uh, interesting points. Let me put those to, to, to Henry Mason and ask, uh, has, has technology been basically unleashed on us? And are we, uh, are we in need of, of better education on how to use it? And the example uh, that Barry is giving there is even just the, the expectation or the desire to have this technology is make, making people make irrational decisions. Yeah, I think, as with anything, you know, when, when something first emerges, then people are un unsure maybe of how, how to handle it. Uh, I, think, I think it's Kevin Kelly who, who puts this the best way, and, and he looks at technology and he acknowledges the dark side of technology and, and you know, says that yes, there, there are, you know, people are using it badly and there <coughs> are dark sides, but actually, you know, if, if, even if the good side of technology is only 1% more than the bad side of technology, over time that compounds and that actually makes the world a much better place. And I think we would agree with him. You know, we're not ignoring the downside of technologies, uh, and people do need to use them carefully. But we think, on balance, the freedom and the opportunities that technology brings to people is a good thing. Uh, let me ask you one thing, Henry. You'd mentioned the, you raised an interesting topic, the issue of mega cities. Now, I wonder with mega cities, um, of course, uh, what Barry was saying was, you know, mobile phones are going out into the rural areas of Africa where they don't even have perhaps the right kind of basic infrastructure for, for you know, food and living and so on. But technology has reached those those areas. But you're referring to people moving into, you know, this increased urbanization into mega cities. What impact do you see those mega cities having on the way society is shaped? I think cities really are, are so different to uh, the rural life that people leave behind, wh whether it be in, in the developed or developing world. And, and really, you know, cities are where we see, uh, as I spoke about earlier, where we see consumers, where people have choices. And, and that's, that's really why they're, they're such a powerful magnet, I think, that you know, even with uh, the mobile technologies, uh, in, in many re respects, all that does is, is alert people to the greater opportunities and the greater range of choices that are available in urban areas. Now it's interesting because uh, Deborah, I know this is an area you have an interest in too, the mega cities, because I know uh, your organization has talked about the redesigning of our in institutional infrastructure from the bottom up, right. saying we need to dismantle some of these mega bureaucracies we've created. But the t trend seems to be pushing towards the bureaucracies, especially if people gather in these, in these mega cities. It's a, it's a byproduct of where we find ourselves, halfway between the industrial age and the uh, knowledge-based uh, society. Um, and there is, uh, addressing your, your last caller, is there is a, a, a desynchronizing effect, if you would. Technology moves faster and faster, but our bureaucracies are, are, are slower and slower, and our education system is even, even slower than that. So it does cause this, this desynchronization and this, um, uh, this, this conflict. And so uh, we will continue to see that for the next couple decades till, till we emerge fully in this new, new society. Now it's interesting that also, Deborah, you mentioned in your 40 for 40 uh, trends that there is a growth in philanthropy capitalism. Yes. And we're seeing that with, for example, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett getting together and saying, we have so much, we want to do something right. useful with it. Uh, what impact do you, do you see that having? Is it just a couple of individuals or is this a growing trend among people where we might see a, a reshaping in the way we value society and what is important. We see it as a reshaping of, of values in, in uh, addressing, again, your, your last caller about uh, uh, Africa. There's a lot of people that are concerned about that, not only individuals, but, uh, but groups, uh, corporations. And uh, you know, what do we do? What do we do as a society? What do we do as a group? What do we do as a, as a global tribe, if you would, to, uh, to raise the economic um, values and, and, and foundation in some of these, these countries? Because we, we are a global market. We are mm -hmm. a, a global society here. And, and we need to watch that. Uh, Henry, mentioned, let me throw something out to you. To what degree are we seeing uh, a, a trend where women are getting a, a fairer chance in the world? It, to what degree is w the power for women growing? I mean, there's talk about you know the U.S. having, well, nearly having its first woman president and maybe having one in the near future, uh, the way women have climbed up corporations. Do you see a change in society such that women have a better position uh, and a fairer position? 
Yes, I think uh, we, we do, and that's uh, that's obviously very welcome. And, and going back to the point about cities, uh, I think that the the two things are actually intrinsically linked. Uh, and it's actually, especially in the developing world, you know, there are uh, greater opportunities for women uh, in cities to run businesses. And you know, we've seen what one industry that's been really successful with this is, is the microfinance industry, where they've actually targeted their loans. At women specifically, and and you know, we, yes, we do see that as a trend that's continuing. And I wonder, Deborah, to get your perspective on this as well, how things things are changing. If if there is more balance, if there's going to be that balance between the have and have nots through uh, philanthropy capitalism, where also there might be a better balance between you know uh, genders. We think so. Um, if if you half if you don't use half your population, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty one sided, and and so we see that uh, that emergence of of women, more women around the world, and in, in power will give give uh, innovation and, and new thought and, and, uh, and that balance to, to solving some problems. One, one question for you, Deborah, actually also with technology growing the way it is, to what degree are individuals losing their privacy? I mean, apart from putting their information out there on social networking sites, to what degree has the fact we're so interconnected with our, you know, pins and chips and credit cards and, you know, RFI devices and so on, how, to what degree are we be losing that individuality? We can be geotagged with our uh, cell phones and goodness knows what else, right. and mobile um, cameras even. Well, I think in, in one sense it, uh, it gives us more individualism because it, um, we need to differentiate ourselves out there in, the, in this open, open space. Uh, the privacy issue, that's, uh, that is a concern because uh, it's a personal choice. You put all that information out there and it can be used in, you know, for good but also for, for, for bad. And so um, the, the privacy question is, is uh, definitely a debate that will continue. I wonder, uh, Henry, a thought that you know, is, is as the, uh, the the world is more becoming more globalized, more inter interconnected. Do you see a rise in sort of global commuting? Planes are getting faster; they're covering longer distances. But there's also now a growth in technology that allows video conferencing and connectivity through the internet. Which which way is it likely to go? Are people going to be traveling more, or are they likely to be using the technology to connect more uh, through remote locations? I think it's going to be like like many things, and it's it's a little bit of both, which is always the easy answer. But you know, that on the one hand, yes, that you know there will be uh, you know greater ability to to work wherever you want, you know, especially if you're a knowledge worker, to to take advantage of these technologies like video conferencing. But on, on the other hand, you know, as we see these these global mega cities emerge, there, there will still be great power, we think, to being in a hub, whether it be an, uh, an artistic hub or a financial hub or a, a tourism hub, and, and, and therefore, you know, there, there will be still clustering and, and uh, you know, in, in these mega cities. Le I think we've got a caller on the line from the UK. Idris, is it? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to contribute on the advent of, uh, especially, technology in the form of mobile phones. Mm -hmm. uh, back in uh, Ghana, it has helped us quite a bit because people used to travel three, four days to get to the capital to transact their business. But this time, people are able to use five, ten minutes to be able to ring up and mm. uh, have a good transactions before they travel. So in event, it has even saved lives because our roads are quite bad and uh, there were quite a lot of accidents on the way. Idris, I've got, we've got about a minute left. I'm going to put this to, to, to Deborah Westphal and ask about that. I mean, we've seen the leapfrogging of technology really helping some parts of the world. Uh, we discussed this a little earlier with Africa and people having mobile phones and so on. And here, um, Idris is saying how it's actually allowed people to be safer because they don't have to make these dangerous journeys. Right. But I wonder to what degree um, le you see leapfrogging of technology uh, in the developing world expanding and growing. Is, is it something that they're able to access technology more easily now? I mean, uh, is, is it something that's a growing trend? In the underdeveloped countries, yes, mm -hmm. it is. And we see that uh, there is a, a leapfrogging of that, that whole industrial uh, age, if you would. Beyond just the telecoms. Just I mean. beyond the telecoms. And, uh, you know, sensors, access to sensors and, and uh, information management systems and, and, and just outreach um, and, and knowledge systems. So uh, we see that, that leapfrogging, which will enable. Uh, there is a downside to that. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, you know, we, we still don't understand what cybersecurity is and, right. and what privacy is, and so 
Um, it's not utopian um, by, by, by means. Well, Deborah Westphal and Henry Mitchell, I want to thank you. Of course, it's always a difficult uh, subject looking ahead at what's happening, but it was great to have you both on. Perhaps you'll both be on by hologram or holographic projection next time we have you on. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you for being with us too. Now remember you can follow the show on Facebook and see what we're up to there. You can give us feedback on topics and post your questions and comments. On the next show, Big Tobacco and the Developing World. It's brought jobs for farmers and tax dollars for emerging nations, but at what point does the damaging health effect from smoking outweigh the financial gains of the global tobacco industry? Be sure to tune in for that. From me and the team, we'll see you next time.